Right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again into Liberty.me Live. Our host tonight, Mike Reed. And this evening, we're here with one of the giants of Liberty, Butler Schaefer, to talk about a wonderful collection of his articles, The Wizards of Ozymandias, which are, uh, to some extent, around the problem of the decline of the West. So uh, just before we turn the recording on, Butler and I were talking about the the very common sense a sensation that every human has that we're standing still and the, earth, the sun goes around us. When in fact, of course, uh, nowadays, so, uh, according to the math and the scientists, and that, that we're turning rapidly and the sun is uh, staying put at least relatively to us over there. And that really calls to mind this fear, wherever you feel like your, your position is stable, that calls to mind how people to think inside Western society. We tend to have this sense that we're stable and firm on bedrock, or our society isn't going anywhere. We're just the West. We've always been West. We're never going to stop being the West. And I think Butler Schaefer's collection calls that easy assumption that we are where we've always sort of been meant to be, where we always are going to be, calls that assumption into question. So. Uh, it's delightful to have you on this evening, and it's going to be great to talk. Can you tell us a little well, bit about uh, this collection? No, first of all, let me uh, apologize to the people who've been accustomed to uh, watching this, this, this particular series on Thursday nights. I couldn't do it Thursday evening because of my, I teach a seminar at the law school on informal systems of order, or what I affectionately refer to it as Anarchy 101. And uh, that class meets at this particular time on, on Thursday. And in the, in the seminar, uh, I, I have, we're a little badge that just says, ultimate question research team. And they wear that more for the purpose of the days we have class, just to wear around the school and get it to raise questions. Like, what, what's that all about? And I said, yeah. Well, I had one one of my students, not in the seminar, but another student who saw that and quickly quipped, you know, a la Douglas Adams, me too. And I said, no, 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 you missed the point. That's an answer. There are all kinds of answers in the world. There are all kinds of people, all kinds of answers. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the ultimate question. So what's the ultimate question? And of course, didn't have that. But <clears throat> the book itself, was more a collection of different articles and some original material and so forth uh, that differs from the first three books. The first book was about the difficulty of we have institutions, how institutions are formed, uh, how they are thinking, and basically how whatever is wrong with all is wrong own thinking. It's not wrong with people who are running the systems that we allow them to operate. The second book, the Trade Trade Book, was uh, a purely research piece on how the business community uh, basically went to war with, or stayed at war with competition and helped to put together uh, uh, Roosevelt's deal and the NRA and so forth. NRA meaning the National Recovery Administration. You always have to qualify that. Um, the third one was uh, the uh, book Boundaries of Order, which was a, a book on the role that pro properties in establishing order in our world. This is more of a collection of different essays that don't have as much to do with a given topic. Uh, I, I get the idea of it from when I was a freshman in college, I was first introduced to uh, someone who has probably now become my favorite poet. That was Percy Shelley, who wrote a book, a book, a book, wrote a poem titled Osmandius. And I'll just read it so that I know to what this verse. It says, A traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command.
expand, tell sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look, I work, she mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Um, and so I uh, kind of thought that's, that's a way of characterizing as Shelley. Shelley was very much of an anarchist, let's face it. Uh, but it was kind of describes institutionalized systems. I don't know if I can, if I will do it, you'll appreciate the cover. Uh, eh, you may appreciate the cover. Osmandius there being in the form of one of the remains found in Turkey some, some time back. But basically what I've tried to do in, in, in this book is to recall that institutions, the problem with that we have with institutions is that they become ends in themselves. They're their own reason for being. It's not just that they are helpful, useful tools uh, as, as organizations, but that they become their own reason for being. And as a result, we are conditioned, we are trained, habituated to identify ourselves with these agencies because we see initially uh, do some nice things for us, you know, business setting or whatever it be. And it's also, I think it's because many of us are simply too lazy to to think through other ways of of organizing how we think the world works. But by being an end in itself, this means that institutions are very resistant to change. There's an old saying, I can't remember who it was that said it, this, the most dangerous thing that we encounter, or one of the most dangerous things, is the but of wanting to repeat our successes. We find something that works, we assume it will always work, so we want to preserve it. And there's something you know, very rational about that uh, on, on a superficial level. Um, and as a result of this, institutions depend upon a lot of structuring. Here, here's a particular belief system, here's a particular uh, organizational uh, system that we have, uh, we want to keep it as it is in order to keep what might be, whether it's the, the, the government or business organization or school or, uh, you know, paper operation or church, whatever it is, whatever we think has provided us with some benefit. And we would like to continue having that benefit provided then we make the mistake of trying to structure what we have gone through um, so as to make it permanent. In other words, if it's going to be an end in itself, it's got to be there forever. And how you make it forever is to have a lot of structuring going on. And this creates a desire therefore permanency that we saw, ref and we've seen reflected a number of times, but certainly saw reflected in the notion that a corporation might be, quote, too big to fail. That's, that's raison d'etre language just in itself. Some organization is too big to fail. It's, it's kind of like one of the characters in the Peanuts cartoon, and who was lamenting the fact that he was too young to die, he was 
too this to die, too that. And finally, the final panel says, I'm too me to die. And that's kind of the way these organizations are. We, we are conditioned to want them around forever. What we do in this process of structuring up, structuring the lives and thinking of people who are going to be subject to the institution and also who are going to be supposedly benefiting from it. What this ignores is that life is really a process. It's really more a verb than it is a noun. Uh, we treat it, however, as more like a noun, that it's something we can, something we can hang on to, something we can uh, revere in some fashion. But life itself is really a process, a process in which living beings are making, continuing to make responses to change they have in their environment. In other words, life is really a, a form of, that's a form, but it's a process that requires an awful lot of resiliency, adaptability. Something changes, you know, we've got to be in a position to change in order to keep up with this. The problem with that, the obvious problem is if we've <clears throat> institutionalized our social organizations, uh, what resiliency, what happens to adaptability, what happens to processes of, of change? And so in, in, in that contest between the need for permanency that institutions have the need for adaptability, uh, autonomy. On the other hand, uh, what are the consequences for, for human life? Let's keep in mind, institutions are not things. They're abstractions. And being abstractions, they are something other than life itself. But we treat them as a, they have some independent kind of being to them uh, to which are which are so important that they're expected to shall we say suppress our own individual personal needs one of the problems we get into here and this is one of the underlying themes that I've had in my in my writings and in my books and in a couple of books that I'm still working on um, we have the pro problem that arises from the collapse of civilizations it's interesting I used when I first started this seminar that I teach at the law school this has been Oh gosh, 25 to go, I'm guessing. Um, I to introduce my students to the seminar by saying, you know, very soon you're going to be facing a collapse of Western solution. It, it's going. It's in the prime. And of course, initially, a lot of students just hawed the idea of, no, it's. How can that be? We've still got a favorite on television or whatever it might be. But in one of the first class of seminars that I taught this, I had a student write a very interesting paper on an emerging system uh, known as the internet. And this is something I think some of the people in the class had heard of this. I certainly, but I didn't know that much about it. He wrote a very definitive paper on the internet and sort of suggested some of its implications. Well, I don't think anyone has really played out or could play out the implications of the internet because what you're really trying to play out is the consequences of the very open 
freedom, spread information around from person. And chaos theory, I'll, I'll get back into that in a few minutes, but chaos has been one of my uh, topics, and I think people who are really interested in the cause of liberty and so forth should focus a lot of attention on understanding what chaos theory is about. It's not about, when, when I talk to people who don't know anything about it, now, like my colleagues or some people, they sort of have the impression, well, chaos is nothing but everything kind of gone to hell and, you know, everything's breaking down and it's in broken pieces and all of that. And it's just a mess. It's in turmoil and so forth. And I said, no, no, no. That's not what it's about. And then I, I get into some more depth on that. That you know, We live this every day. It's kind of like the question of, of anarchy. And people say, have you ever, has there ever been a society where anarchy works? And I said, yeah, the one you're in right now. You live an anarchistic life. Unless some of you that I may not know about, unless you manage to go get groceries at the store or deal with your neighbors or whatever, drive on the freeways uh, with a gun and shoot at people or threaten if they don't give you groceries and, and so forth. You do that, and of course, I've never found it. anyone said, no, I, why not? That's what anarchy is. You're respecting the other person, respecting their boundaries. You're dealing with them peacefully. So it does work. Uh, so if you think of it in terms of how people address one another, how they deal and negotiate with one another, the idea of respect for autonomy, respect for uh, the property rights of others, respect for peace and so forth, uh, is the, the essence of it. So, but once, once you have structured a social system, and, and bear in mind, uh, social organizations are essential to our, our well-being. You know, people who think, well, this libertarian philosophy involves a whole bunch of millions of people off living in caves and not have anything to do with one another. Utter nonsense. It's just utter nonsense. I couldn't get along with people. Neither could, none of, none of us could. If after we had been born, our dropped us in, on the side of the road, or today in a trash container at a shopping mall, um, we wouldn't have survived. The species wouldn't have survived. So we require cooperation, support, love from a lot of other people. This through social organizations. The question is, what's the nature of the organization? Is it peaceful and respectful of one individual toward another, or is it based on on violence, and to the degree it's based on violence, to the extent that we are trying to preserve an existing form that we have found useful, or the, the very least a form that we've identified ourselves with to such a degree that you know the idea of the loss of the institution would be a loss of ourselves. I think this is why. So many otherwise intelligent people support wars, you know, it's like, and, and turn their back when the war machinery uh, starts producing results they don't like. Because if they identify with the state and the state is off doing these terrible things, oh my God, I'm doing these terrible things. And so, you know, Americans would be less likely to want to be critical of that behavior unless it was another government. If another government did it, oh yeah, that's that's fine. I'm not I don't identify with the Germans or the Russian or British or whatever government. So yeah, they were a bunch of bad guys, but not mine because that's me. Well anyway, the 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 more we get into these kinds of patterns of thinking and the behavior that follows from it, the need to structure these social systems. The need to protect them from change. Uh, the need to them, well, the, the, the too big to fail uh, model again. To that extent, we interfere with the processes of growth, growth of creativity, and so forth, upon which the health of any civilization depends. 
And, you know, you can read all kinds of historians on this question. I, you can go all the way back to about 2,500 years for those who like to read more of the ancients to uh, the Greek uh, Heraclitus. He said, nothing endures but change. Yeah, that's it. It's modernly we kind of made it popular saying the only thing the only thing that stays constant is the processes of change. But Jacob Burkhardt, another historian, made a similar comment many decades later, said that the essence of history is change. If we expected the world just to remain constant, life would be kind of what you see reflected in those strange people who, when their pet dog dies, take it to a taxidermist and have it stuffed. That's Fluffy? That's good old Fluffy who was with us for 12 years? No! <laughs> Fluffy's gone. But that's what we do in our social life, isn't it? We have these, these presumed needs for permanence. And so your life, your wealth, whatever it is you have, your whole purpose in life is centered around preserving all of that. Well, one of the problems we get into with this whole notion of, of structuring is that structuring presumes that order can be imposed by intelligent planning and direction, that I can create a system of order. And worse, I can create a system of order that's going to work for all of mankind. This is where things uh, fall apart. Because one of the things that this attitude runs into is, again, chaos theory. Chaos theory tells us what? That the world is too complex to be predictable. I tell my students, you, know, you can't even predict what's going to happen to you between now and a week from today. Or you can make some general say, yeah, I'll get up and I'll have breakfast. And I'll do no, no, I make very specific predictions. Aunt Edith's going to fall and break her leg. Uh, the earthquake is going to hit at 11.57 a.m. Things of this sort. You can't predict that. And yet, we're right on the assumption that we can. I know that there's <laughs> a case involving the uh, depositing of nuclear waste out in Nevada. Uh, so on some mountain out there that was powers that be in Washington thought that would be an ideal place to dump all of this nuclear waste. And it went through the courts, and the judge who was handling the case made the statement, and he said what he wanted it was to have some timeline drawn out to show what the impact of all this would be in that area for the next one million years. Now, how many ice ages have we had in the past one million years? See, a number of them. Uh, it's got to go through that. Nevada is in the midst of both volcanic and earthquake activity. A lot of weather conditions there. Uh, a lot of other just purely physical things. You know, maybe, maybe that part of the world is going to get hit by a meteorite uh, the, the way Arizona did or whatever. But the idea that scientists or anyone of that nature, uh, lawyers even worse, can sit down and draw out, predict the consequences or what are going to be happening here in this part of the world for a million years <clears throat> would, as the old saying goes, nowhere be so dangerous as in the hands of people who thought they were fit to, to exercise it. And from this, they begin to make a lot of rules and regulations. I mean, after all, we're going to have a structured world. We've got to know what we're, what we're structuring and what the consequences are. And we go back to Plato's Republic with his philosopher kings. If we had just the right people 
with the right dispositions, right knowledge, and certainly wisdom, because the people at the top of the political are endowed with really great, great wisdom, I'll admit, right? Like you know, John McCain and Hillary and people like this, really people you'd rely upon for advice on how to, how to live your life or raise your children or whatever. But this is still the assumption that we have, that we can plan all of this, and that people, quote, experts, I was noticing there's a book out, some of the tyranny of experts or something like that. We have experts who know all of this stuff. Well, what is it they know? They know a little corner of a piece of tapestry that they have little connection with the other pieces. And, you know, it goes back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle about the observer being the observed and one of the consequences of that. Um, that what, whatever I offer as my prediction of what's going to happen or should happen is influenced by what I already know. Is it possible for us to talk intelligently about anything without drawing upon what it is already know. And Heisenberg said, no, you know, you, uh, in the notion that you can't know both the position and the velocity of a, uh, of a particular particle at any given point in time, this carries over into realization that we can't be aware of, we can't understand the interconnectedness of all of these influences happening at once. And so chaos theory says in a, in a complex system, you can't know that. It's not that we need more information, because what we end up with with more information is more uncertainty. Einstein put it very well, though, as the circle of light increases, so does the circumference of darkness around it. And so we, when, when we accumulate more knowledge, more information about things, it also raises more questions mm -hmm. at the side of each little piece of data. And yet we have a hard time getting over the hubris of thinking that, well, if I just really work at it, I will understand all this stuff so well that I can predict outcome of, of complex relationships. Theory says, forget it. The world has to run itself. And this, this is, I think, the hardest thing, or one of the hardest things for otherwise intelligent people uh, to come to grips with. Because we've, we've been taught in the schools, oh, we're capable of doing all this stuff. That's what knowledge is all about. The more knowledge we have, the wiser we are, et cetera, et cetera. This, this is it's nice to think that. It's probably ego salving for a lot of people, but it's just not consistent with the real world. Civilizations really depend on creativity and resiliency, which means civilizations, as with, if you treat it as Toynbee did, you know, as, as like analogous to an organic system. Uh, you're not going to live very long if you're struggling to maintain equilibrium, to just be steady and be in an unchanging situation. The only time you or I are going to be in an equilibrium state is when we're dead. Nothing else is going on. There's no change taking place, no creativity, no life process. I remember seeing in a display at one time, I think I wrote about this elsewhere, but of a man who was studying the eye of a mosquito and he was studying it under a microscope. And he said, hey, look, look at the microscope and this eye, he saw bright flashing colors of orange and green, yellow and red and so forth. And then all of a sudden, the eye of the mosquito went dead, it went black. The mosquito was dead. The mosquito no longer had that flash of 
energy that exhibited itself in all of these colors. It now just went blank. And I, I've noticed that I wrote an article sometime back about how sports teams are in this country are using so, so much the way of black color forms and so forth, which are not the, the school colors or the professional team's colors. I think it's more of a reflection of kind of the the nature of our culture. Uh, we are, it may just be a reflection of the fact that we understand that the civilization is dying, so is old Siwash Yu. <laughs> it's all these institutions are going their way. Um, I've always maintained that the civilizations are created by individuals, but they're destroyed by collectives. I mean, if you think somebody would say, okay, write down factors that you think were so important in the development of Western civilization. You're going to be thinking of names, aren't you? Well, there's Shakespeare, and there's Copernicus, and there's Einstein, and there's Van Gogh, and there was, you know, the Curies, and Beethoven, and da 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 You don't think of it in terms of, yeah, there was that, the Writer's Project back under the New Deal, or some particular guild that formulated what? Basically, what they're formulating is, is a static a static position. Let's kind of protect ourselves by getting rid of all the uncertainty that's out there. And many historians have, have reflected this. Carol Quigley uh, once observed that the collapse of civilizations, that they, they do collapse when what do you call the instruments of expansion get institutionalized? And instruments of expansion, in his sense, was the economic system, for example. When it gets institutionalized, when it gets so structured that it is increasingly difficult to be creative or even resilient to change, then the whole process starts to come unglued. It doesn't have to be an industrial system. You could have the same thing with an agricultural system. You could have it with an institute, with a civilization rather that was grounded in maybe even music. You know, I don't know what extent the Etruscans were. Uh, they were music was a very important part of their of their culture. I don't know to what extent it was so important that a change in that brought about the demise of the Etruscans. Uh, William von Humboldt later said that the civilized society of, quote, human development in its richest diversity. Well, doesn't that sound like something that libertarians might find useful in terms of sense of autonomy and an openness to change? Human development in its richest diversity. Diversity sort of negates the whole idea of equilibrium, of, of static, of structure. It means you, you're doing your thing, I'm doing my thing, someone else is doing something else, and we put it all together and we start getting, as chaos theory reminds us, we start getting results that nobody could have anticipated. And all of this really began with uh, Gutenberg. Uh, I think when Gutenberg made available uh, invention of movable type then became possible for a lot of just ordinary people to start reading things. And what they read were things that were, you know, were raising questions in their minds. You know, they'd been going to church and the, the, the priest of the church said it's this, 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 and this. And they read in the Bible and say, I don't find that in there. And what happens when one of these institutional authorities says one thing and it's a support, supposed to support something else? 
people start to ask questions. And it goes back to my informal systems of order seminar. You know, we're looking for the, the ultimate the ultimate question, well, there is no ultimate question. As one of my beloved professors in law school said, you know, the, <clears throat> what's really important in trying to learn anything is to keep getting to deeper and deeper levels of questions. So you get to the place where the level of questioning kind of answers itself. You become aware of, of, of this. Uh, Arnold Toynbee. Uh, was very good on this. Toynbee sort of treated societies as uh, in the metaphor organic system. But he said that a, a civilization begins to break down when there is a loss of creative power in the souls of creative individuals in which differentiation and diversity are replaced by a tendency toward standardization and uniformity. She said the final disintegration is characterized by increased momentum and a forcible political unification in a universal state. Sound familiar, kids? Does this sound like anything, oh, I don't know, we might have thought about or read about and so forth recently? Yeah. Yeah, the whole process, uh, say just of economic regulation, if you just want to focus on economics, which is any, maybe one of the more important areas to, to focus on, how much really free economic activity can be engaged in and how much of it is, is held back by structuring and the need for uniformity? Are you talking about minimum wage laws or product standards or anything like that. It's all got to be the same. It's all got to be the same. Why? Well, that's just the way things are. The law is the law. Well, if you go back even further, what you usually come down to is the explanation or the rationale that it's all for the protection of the economic system so it doesn't collapse. I remember when <clears throat> There have been pains to uh, license milk producers. I, I, I don't know that. I think that campaign is largely over for these people. Uh, they, they're in power. And so you get uh, legislatures creating these dairy product advisory commissions. And their function is to do what? To set minimum prices for dairy products. Why? Why do we need to protect the existence of the dairies? Why is that important? Any of you with children know why that's so important. Why? So the kitties will have strong bones and teeth. You don't want your child to grow up without the benefits of milk, do you? Well, then you'd better support this kind of a program. Just based on utter economic ignorance, the kind that Murray Rothbard was so fond of, of pointing out. You know, it's just, you know, it, it's self-interest masquerading as let's do it for the children, let's do it for national security, let's do it for God, let's do it for whatever. Uh, there is something out there, there's some value out there that's so important that we've got to keep the world running just the way it is. I think, I think it was H.L. Mencken who said that the, the purpose of education is to make you want the society just as it's presently organized. You know, don't want any changes. Uh, Will and Ariel Durant uh, made much the same kind of observations that a healthy society, a healthy civilization requires individuals who are capable of effective responses to new situations. Again, how is that possible without the liberty, property interests, and so forth around which people are able to act in the world? How can you act in the world in a creative, 
productive way without having the liberty to act, without having property upon which you're going to act. Well, you can see from this, I think, how political structuring, you know, treating institutions as ends in themselves has, has helped to destroy civilizations, not just the present one, but civilizations generally. I, mean, I don't know if there are any people who still think Western civilization is alive and, and kicking. It's not. The civilization is gone. They, they, it's, I, I liken it to <clears throat> the existence of a dinosaur known as a stegosaurus. And as kids who were interested in dinosaurs, you'd remember this. This was the, the dinosaur that was shaped like a, a bell-shaped small head at one end, small tail at the other, and a great big middle. Now, you, that was it. <laughs> but this, this stegosaurus was so complex and had so much body weight to it that it really required two brains in order to function. It, it had a brain in its tail, and it had a, a brain in its head. And so the, the head of the stegosaurus might be quietly chomping away at oh, some bushes or something, eating some nice leaves that it found, while its tail is, had just been done in by a, a Tyrannosaurus rex. And the stegosaurus just goes on happily, uh, munching away, not realizing that it's already dead. It's like the response you sometimes, well, not sometimes, you often see from a chicken that's just had its head removed. I've seen this a number of times, having grown up in the Middle West and been visited many, many farms of my relatives. It's not a pretty sight. And after had its head chopped off, it flaps and flutters around and spewing blood in all directions and so forth, making a lot of noise, a lot of action. You don't want to get in its way, but its fate has already been sealed. And I think that's where Western civilization is now. It's making a lot of noise. Let's go declare war any place. We don't care. What, what does it matter? Let's have the, uh, let's have the military and, and policemen and so forth just do whatever they want to do. If they want to shoot someone, that's fine. I'm going to do a blog for LewRockwell.com on the, the this bad snowstorm that hit uh, New England in the last day or two. And in at least one of these states, the government had ordered people to stay off the streets. You know, don't go out. You can't travel. And thinking, how are they going to enforce this? And with the popular popularization among many, many people of this movie American Sniper, which I have not seen, but I've read enough reviews of it and heard enough descriptions and defense of it by enough otherwise sane people, uh, I can I can almost imagine, you know, policemen being given high-powered rifles, and you don't, want, you don't want these guys out in the terrible weather doing this work. I mean, that's, you know, that's threatening the, quote, assets of the state. And the state refers to them that way, that people who work for the state are assets. So instead, let's have them uh, in offices or other buildings where it's nice and warm, and they can watch out the window with their high-powered rifles and shoot people that they see walking in violation of these edicts. That's the American sniper. And I can just imagine Clint Eastwood coming up with a film on that, maybe converting Dirty Harry into a sniper who's out there just knocking off all of these disobedient souls. I also had a, a, a chapter in the book that is sometimes just fun to talk about. I, I had a great deal of admiration for uh, Captain Sullenberger, who you may remember is the pilot of the U.S. plane that took off from LaGuardia shortly after takeoff. It 
ran into a flock of birds who immediately just destroy the engines. The plane is now powerless. And what Sullenberger is now flying is a glider. What do you do? Well, he called upon the established authorities. What do I do with this? And they were suggesting, well, maybe you can limp back to, I think, some air, airport in New Jersey and so forth. And you might be able to make it there. And I, I can just imagine Sullenberger <laughs> going through his head like, yeah, I can also envision us crashing into a lot of apartment buildings and we'll be on the six o'clock news in, in no time. But instead, he opted for the intelligent maneuver. So where could I land this, this plane with the least amount of damage? Well, what was in front of him? The river, the Hudson River. And this, this option came to his mind, I think, because more than just being the pilot of a jet airliner, he was also an experienced glider pilot. And he knew he was now flying a glider. And you don't have very many options when you're flying a, a glider except to find a nice place to lie down and maybe hope for <laughs> some gust of wind that will take you up a little bit, but that's about it. And so he landed in the river. All the people were saved on it. And what was most interesting, if any, for anyone who saw that, and you might be able to go on YouTube and find video of it. Um, there were a lot of ferry boats crossing the river at that time, and they saw, saw what happened. And these ferry boat operators immediately ran their ferry boats over to where the plane was. There was one ferry boat operator, I remember, who got his ferry boat up underneath the tail of the plane in order to keep it from going under. And there's this lovely picture of, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 ferry boats surrounding this airplane, helping people off. This is an, this is an informal system of order. I doubt that these people, you know, have any kind of yearly reunions or build statues to them or anything like that. But I strongly suggest that what probably is going to happen, or probably already has happened, is that the FAA would say, aha, things like this can happen, so let's structure some new rules and regulations. Let's have some standardization. Let's have some uniformity that Toynbee and others have, have warned us about. So that the next time this happens, and this is, this is one of the models, it's, it's really a mantra that the institutionalists and the statists mumble every time something goes wrong. We will find out what went wrong and fix it so that it doesn't happen again. And that'll be, that'll be the song and dance. And now, woe unto the next pilot who has to face what Sullenberger had to face and who didn't have the same experience that Sullenberger had as a glider pilot. So when this happens, Get out, get out the book, Charlie. Let's see what it says we're supposed to do here. Then you'll have a plane landing in <laughs> some apartment complex someplace, and that will be it. The final point in this book, and one that I really encourage libertarians to focus on, is that all of these changes are going on, and the changes are going on, and we're going to have, I find, I'm, just, I'm a, a very optimistic soul on all this. I think the, the long-term future for humanity is a very bright one, because I think this cancer is finally going away with regard to uh, the institutional order. I don't know what form it will take, but you already begin to see initial forms, decentralization, secession movements, um, a tendency for behavior to become much more individualized rather than other. 
the movement away from vertically structured top down authoritative models to horizontal networking of people. The internet is a perfect example. You turn to network, a network newscast, they will give you the story, what they want you to believe from the top down. I had a friend of mine who's, who was a uh, newscaster out here in, in Los Angeles, and he was fond of saying, I was always tempted to go on the air and say, good morning, and here are the lies your government would like to have you believe today. Well, if people put out lies and so forth, on the internet, what happens to them? You know, they get corrected rather quickly. And the people who put them out are looked upon as you ain't reliable. I don't want I don't want to waste my time with you anymore because you're just not reliable. And I think that's the direction this is going. But I think it's also going back to involve us in something we've been unaccustomed to dealing with, and that's the, the spiritual dimensions of being human. And when I say spiritual, I don't, I'm, I'm not just referring to going to church or something. I, in my Calculated Chaos book, you can see that I've been rather critical of churches as I have other institutions, because if they become ends in themselves, it's just another suppression of the individual. But there is something that even organized religions appeal to in human beings and have been for hundreds of thousands of years that you just can't write off and say, well, that's just a lot of goofy people and so forth. There's something there. And I think that something that's there is a need for spirituality. And I mean this in the sense of a need for a sense of transcendence a need to connect up with the rest of life, the rest of the universe in some meaningful way. And we haven't done that. You know, we've been we've we've more learned how to be obedient to institutional authorities. What if we can transcend that? What if we can move move beyond all of that? And really discover the, the spiritual dimensions of peace and liberty. I had a discussion with a, a well-known man. <laughs> well, now I don't, I, I, I don't want to personalize it here because of, you know, he's not here to participate in it, but I was talking about is the importance of being able to quantify the, the consequences of particularly economic activity. He's a guy I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I really do. I think he's really done a lot of good work. But in this area, he's, I think, has, has hit a blind spot. If you can't quantify it, you can't talk about it as an economist. And I said, I think this is completely wrong. And I asked him, this man happens to be Jewish, I asked him, said, how how would you, from an economic point of view, how would you do a cost-benefit analysis of Auschwitz? And he thought, said, well, you're absolutely right. It's just that as an economist, I can't talk about that. And I said, well, maybe economists need a new language. Maybe they need to talk not without numbers, but to realize that there's something uh, beyond simply quantification that needs to be taken into account. This is one of the things that long ago attracted me to the Austrian School of Economics, <clears throat> that the costs aren't of something are not just something you can describe with numbers. The benefits are not just something that has a dollar sign dimension to it. It tells us something about what it is that's important for us to learn just how to live as human beings.
I've commented before that you know, I, I would be in favor of individual liberty, peace and individual liberty, even if somebody could demonstrate, even if the consequences were that we would live less well. I treat that as enough of, of an end in itself that I would be willing to make that choice. And I think we have to start thinking in those in those terms because people who can allow themselves to be simply be bought off with numbers, especially numbers that have dollar signs in front of them. What is it what is it we tend to think of people who will do anything for money? Anyway, I that's I don't know if anyone has any questions or arguments or discussion or anything on that? But the Q&A box, so we're more likely to see it. James is... I'm sorry, I was talking to the audience, uh, James and Ken. And... So are, are you talking to me or to yeah, somebody so, else? Yeah, uh, so anyway, those, you know how it works. Those guys will type questions and then I'll... Uh, oh, okay. So that, whatever you're saying to me, I... I wanted to ask I, I'm, I'm really still back in the green eye shade and quill pen, not quite, but I'm trying to almost figure out how we can think era. intelligently about what a civilization is or what a civilization means if we're not thinking about it sure, in terms yeah, of okay, yeah. structured yeah, that's institutions. Like, what do we mean when we say something like the West if we're not talking about like Magna Carta or whatever. Right. Right. Or, you know, or the political system. You know, I suppose that's, that's part of it. Uh, we tend to think like a, a, a country. We think of a country as something unified by a political, by a political system. But we also, in terms of politics, have to remember that even the political scientists, Max Weber and others, have uh, defined the state as an institution that enjoys a legal monopoly on the use of violence. Now. If that's the case, then the question becomes, what, what is going to be the nature of a civilization that is dominated by politics that are, by definition, uh, grounded in violence? Are we going to have a violent system? Yeah. I mean, just look around. And I'm, I'm surprised at how many people I've got. Just today, I got into discussion with a couple of people about the uh, the American Sniper film, and also the uh, uh, the drone bombings. There was one uh, report that of the 41 people who were uh, the so-called terrorists, and we don't know what that means either, 41 people who were killed by uh, drone bombings by the U.S., 1147 otherwise innocent people were also killed. Well, I'm, I, I find myself very troubled by the fact that no, I shouldn't say nobody, very few people want to think that through. The, the American Sniper film is, I haven't seen it, um, but I've read enough reviews of it and seen enough defenses made of it by people who really liked it. I think, is this, is this really what it means to be, quote, patriotic or to be responsible or to be whatever it is you're, you're thinking are important attributes? Is this, is this the essence of that? Mm -hmm. And the answer, the very shallow answer I get from a number of people, things like, well, he meant well. Right. Well, that's our new moral standard, isn't it? You have good intentions, it doesn't matter how. How much damage you do, right? You know, by that by that test, someone could even uh, you know absolve Hitler of his offenses. Well, he meant well. He meant to improve Germany. 
So forget that, you know, the process, all these people were killed. I'm not, I'm not prepared for that. <laughs> I think I have a little different standard than that. And, uh, but I, I see, I don't know, so little of a, even a willingness, much less the ability yeah. To do any in-depth thinking about as as you know, by the president. moral, spiritual, philosophic principles, as as standards of behavior, should people be doing a, this to other people? As long as you're following orders, and we get legalistic answers to that, don't we? Well, that's what the law says, and we've done this even with the. Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, this is something that um, something that Newt Gingrich had said in terms of a few years back, talking about the importance of due process of law, and he said, "Well, as long as somebody is making a decision, so that's due process." About, well, you can say that about the street mugger, can't thinking you? Thinking about living in that kind of in in our world. I mean, the sad part of it is, I think people being, like this really believe that, this nonsense. Uh, the majority it's of the population is you it, rushing it's toward a, it's, psychopathy. Um, James, uh, here's James Walton's really question. And he says, how can individuals Just respond to a society you want. and workplace that's filled with yeah. Ozymandian institutions? I don't know how you pronounce Ozymandian, but that's my shot at it. Uh, how can we be creative and resilient in the context of a larger decline? You know, what, what can we do as individuals to flourish in our own lives? Right. Well, in some cases, you might decide, <laughs> I want out of that institution. I don't want to be a part of, of, of a system that's doing stuff like that. The other is to do, uh, maybe be creative within the institution, especially if it's a, a market-oriented institution to where you're not, you're having fewer um, physical consequences. Uh, penalties and so forth, and you might have dealing with with the state. When I practiced law, we I represented uh, management in the area of labor law, and I spent uh, I'd say about half my time working with clients on how to improve their managerial systems, getting away from the top down model. We we were doing this oh god, almost sixty years ago. I ain't that old. Yes, I am. <laughs> but the idea that so much of management is based on this top-down model, isn't it? The president or the plant manager or whoever it is you're answerable to sits atop this pyramid and issues edicts. You do this, you do that. Charlie, you do this. Sally, you do this, and so forth. And you do what you're told, you go get a job someplace else. Well, that's a terrible way to run any kind of a system. Uh, instead, we developed, I don't know we developed, I think other people have been doing this as well, but we encouraged our clients to engage in what we call participatory management. You bring the employees in to the decision making that is is relevant to the level of their work. So if you're talking about you know changing some methodology involving the operation of a punch press, um, you bring in the guys who work with the punch presses. You don't bring in the guys from the accounting. You don't bring in the the vice president who might not even know what a punch press is. And so you expand effective decision making in such a way that the people who are actually doing the work have more of an input as to what's going to happen. An example of this, there was a company that was involved with publishing uh, major news magazines. And these are the ones that, you know, the, something happens on a Saturday, you know, it better be on the newsstand on Monday. I mean, that type of speed. And there was one instance I remember hearing about of uh, somebody who 
there was this is all camera ready type of uh, production work, and they had a an advertisement on one of the pages in the magazine for probably an automobile, and the picture that had been sent by the advertising department of the auto manufacturer it just didn't fit the page and so the guy who's doing the camera work trying to get this set up for production uh, has to f figure out you know if we if we just do it as sent it's going to defeat the purpose of the of the ad well it used to be you would he would go to his immediate supervisor who'd go back up to the plant superintendent who might then get in contact with the uh, advertising director of the car manufacturing firm who would get in contact with their the particular employee who was working on that project and maybe in a day or two's time you get that straightened out well you don't have a day or two's time how do you cut through all of that you let the guy the employee at the car manufacturing uh, end of things communicate directly with the employee who's doing the camera work for the magazine. Nobody else even, even knows what's going on about this. It's not a problem. They're working it out. Well, I notice here that you have the, the car set up this way. Can we change that in some way? Can we widen it, shorten it, whatever it may be? And the other person says, ah, I think maybe we couldn't. So they work out an arrangement. And sure enough, the, when the magazine comes out the following week, the people who have been involved with getting that done are satisfied with it. And plant manager and the stockholders and the board of directors and the CEO, they didn't know anything about it. This is what happens when you decentralize management. You're decentralizing it into the hands of the people who know the most at work. You don't put it in the hands of some guy who should make the decision simply because of some title that he has in the hierarchy. You want somebody who knows what he's up to. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's one way. I I also think part of the answer to this to this question, it's a very good question. I think part of the answer lies in an insistence on doing something just because it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, I was think of, of Ron Paul's political campaign and so forth, and how easy it would have been for him to have simply bailed out on a number of questions and become more uh, attractive to the statists who had no use for him. I mean, he's thinking. No, he just stuck to his guns because it's, it's the right thing to do. We we should not be using drone bombers on on people. But what what what's our rationale for not doing it? Because it's wrong to do it. How's that, Charlie? You know, <laughs> and uh, so I think I think this comes back to the spiritual dimensions of our behavior. We've got to begin thinking of what can I live with. We have, what is it now, the federal government, the War Department, as I insist on calling them, they're not the Defense Department. They were the War Department when I was a kid. They remain the War Department. They're the ones who conduct wars. But the War Department in this country now acknowledges that there are about 22 soldiers, former soldiers, who commit suicide every day. Now, these aren't all just current soldiers. I mean, these and go back to guys who were in World War II or Vietnam or Korea or whatever. But every day, there are 22 former soldiers, or, so, or present soldiers, because they're present soldiers subject to the same pressures, who commit suicide every day. Why? Maybe, maybe there's something that is, that what they have been doing for these many years has kind of eaten away at their sense of their inner their inner sense their sense of spirituality this was not what i wanted to do as a living i was one day i was on 
two different radio programs interviewed, one in, I think, down in Texas and one in Pittsburgh, as I recall. And I was talking about the same basic subject, and I had seven or eight former soldiers who called in and supported what I was saying. And they, said, they all said, basically, I I've, I've fought in the war in Korea or World War II or Vietnam or whatever. I didn't do so in order to just promote the political ambitions of those in power. In other words, there was there was some sense of rightness, if you will, that they didn't see being promoted. Now, how I don't think there's any rightness in war, period. So don't misunderstand me. But at least I think they were going through the process of evaluating what on earth have I done. And when you have 22 per day killing themselves, what about the ones who don't? What about the ones who just take it out on their families or just go shoot up the place or become police officers in towns where they can just maim, shoot, bully other people? We don't think about that. And to the extent the system does, they think about it in terms of, well, what drugs can we give them to calm them down? Great, wonderful approach. <laughs> yeah, just play with it. I mean, so much of this stuff is just a matter of as I, as I tell my students, it's not so much the answers we come up with, it's improving the quality of the questions that we ask. My all-time favorite professor of anything was Malcolm Sharp, who one of my law professors at Chicago. And he used the Socratic method. He would almost never answer a direct question. I, 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 I play my classrooms the same way. But if you were to ask him what time is it, you'd probably get an answer. Well, we're talking about clock time. We're talking about psychological time. We're talking about time in some universal sense. What do you mean? And he said, well, I just mean clock time. Well, why is that important? Is there some place you need to be that's more important than what you're doing right now? And so, so he kept going through this process. And he had one student in the class who would ask a question, and Sharp would say, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You ought to think about that some more. And maybe a couple of weeks later, the student would ask another question. The sharp would, would say something along the lines of, yeah, that, that is interesting. <laughs> you might want to consider that in line with that question you asked a couple of weeks ago. See what, see what you follow from that. Well, eventually, the student just got fed up with this and came into Sharp's office with his letter of resignation. He wanted out of law school. He came to law school to get answers. And every time he asked the question, all he ever got was another question. And he said, Sharp talked with him for, I think it was over two hours in his office, and just said, and developed the awareness that learning how to do anything, learning to do something well, is a process of continuing to improve the quality of your questions. So he stuck it out, and at the end of the year, in those days, we started classes in September, and went all the way to May, and then had uh, one set of exams. So he uh, and, and Sharp taught contracts. And this student later wrote, I, <clears throat> I got the highest grade on Professor Sharp's contracts exam. My answers to a series of hypotheticals were nothing more than a collection of questions. If you write the, if you ask the right questions, as Milton Mayer once said, you know, the questions that can be answered aren't worth asking. They really aren't. They really aren't. The questions that keep bugging the hell out of you, you know, the questions that you just, 
And the more you think about it, the more questions that come up. The more questions that come up, the more questions that come up. That's where understanding comes from, how you ask questions, not, not from answers. Answers are easy. Sometimes. The future for humans, how can we do better today when uh, we're living in the, the ruins of Western civilization? Um, earlier on today, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, part of that is, you know, you have, a, you and I and everyone else has a lot of energy. Life is whatever, however we, we care to define it, it is sort of the mobilization of energy, kind of a, a will to exist, if you will, if you want to think of it in those terms. But we have a lot of energy. And we can utilize that energy in a variety of ways. We can use it, utilize it productively. We can use it, utilize it destructively. And I think that in this setting, we have to, or we should ask ourselves, is the approach that I'm taking uh, consistent with how I think I want to live? And so many people, you know, it's, this is, the, the sort of the common approach that you see in our world today is, you know, if I want to make the world a better place, I'm going to run for office. <clears throat> well, you don't, you don't, that just doesn't work very well, as Ron Paul discovered. What Ron Paul did do, very effective. He raised a lot of questions. He got people asking questions that they hadn't asked before. He got people thinking about things like the Federal Reserve System. How many people even knew there was a Federal Reserve System 20, 25 years ago? Probably not too many. So you get people asking questions. This is what, this is what Gutenberg did. His, his invention put more information into the hands of individuals. What was the net effect of that? Well, we had things like, oh, I don't know, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, had a lot of these very creative, powerful influences that helped to create and define Western civilization. Now, through all the structuring that we've allowed to take place, through all of the uh, institutionalization that we have tolerated, that seems, seems to have gone past, past on, its, uh, on its way. But we do have something that Gutenberg didn't have. We've got the internet. And the internet gives us far more communicative power than anything Gutenberg dreamed of. You and I, you and I have the capacity, the first time in human history, we have the capacity to communicate directly with every human being on the planet, all seven billion. Only two things are required. One, each of these persons has a computer that's connected to the internet. And two, they want to be connected to us. And if they don't want to communicate with us, they won't and vice versa. But we have the capacity to kind of send things around. I sent something around yesterday, I think it was, uh, to one person and ended up receiving it back from some other people that I hadn't really expected they would have gotten it. It's just, it's just the way that it is. And it's lovely. I, I, I love all of this. But we need to be comfortable playing with the system. Have fun with it. This, this, this is one of the things I always emphasize. You know, life is at the very least is supposed to be fun. Have fun with all of this stuff. You know, it's just 
you know, when we when we get so grim, that, you know, well, I'll be happier in another life, or my grandchildren will be happy. No, 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 no. Do it for yourself. Leonard Reed, one of the I've always considered one of the intellectual founders of whole libertarian thinking, said, "Be the kind of person that your philosophy represents. Be that person." Be the happy, fun-loving, creative, spiritually driven, focused, being critical when you need to be critical, which is much, very much of the time, to be all of these things. And what happens is people start coming around to you and say, hey, what, 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 what's with you, Mike? What? You seem to be so happy all the time. You, you seem be living a good life. What, what do you know that I don't know? There was a time I had a number of, of friends. This is when I was teaching out at Rampart College. I had a number of friends who worked for the Boeing Corporation back when Boeing was a little more emphasis on commercial airlines and bombers and so forth, but that's another story. And some of these people had been down at the school where I taught. And if they found some, some guy who was, they thought might be interested in this, they would get together and they say be a group of five, four of them would be people who'd been to the school and they would just talk with each other about the school and not directing any of it to him at all. And pretty soon he's asking questions. Oh, what are you talking about? What is this? Where is this school? What is it? And pretty soon this guy is, is hooked. You know, and he wants to come down and find out as well. So here's another student <laughs> who comes down. But, you know, there, there's a lot of this communication within your own groups. That maybe it's just taking the form of questioning. That's, and, 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 and assuming the questioning goes beyond who's going to be on Dancing with the Stars this week. Uh, but, you know, sometimes just sitting around discussing some of these ideas with friends opens up more inquiries than any of us can sit down and anticipate. This is one of the nice things about, again, about chaos theory. You, can, you can't know what, things that I say may or may not have an influence on somebody who hears it that I hadn't really anticipated. It's just the fun of it. It's just playing with the spontaneity of it. This stuff is supposed to be fun because life is supposed to be fun. Life is supposed to be enjoyable. It's not a drudge. It's not a dreary kind of, oh, golly. I'll be glad when I'm dead and I won't have to put up with this anymore. That's not. Come on. Play with it. <laughs> But be careful what you get yourself into. <laughs> I mean, there are these, some of these, like going back to the sniper thing, it gets, oh, it's just fun. It was like, this was just the thing to do. We're wonderful. Why is killing other people fun for you? Nobody asks those questions. A few, few people ask them. There's a number of people who do ask those questions. It's very annoying to the people who don't want those questions asked. Because to a large extent, the political system in our culture is under the control of the people who are the keepers of the questions. You see this, you see this in the news media, on television. You turn on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or anything, and it's just a very narrow range of people they have on to talk about something when they start bringing on the people who question the direction of all this stuff, well, then, okay, maybe you can give some respect to it. But in the meantime, you know, if we're talking about a war, they bring in retired military people, or re people from the defense contracting industry or some academician who's written a book in defense of war and so forth. God, we have four or five people on, you know, what's wrong with that? Well, I didn't see that you had any critics of it. 
you know, it's it's something to remember. You know, I, it wasn't that many years ago that we used to think of the Soviet Union as a very repressive, tyrannical regime, which it was. I mean, anyway, it's yeah. not a matter of making comparisons. It really was. Who would have thought that 20 or 30 years later, people who wanted to escape the oppression in America would run to Russia for protection? I think that's an interesting question. I'd like to ask all of these <laughs> uh, conservatives, the neocons and so forth, although I prefer to think not, neo means new, so new cons. And so these, these are former conservatives, so I like to call them ex-cons. I think that's really far more the ex-cons and let's seek power. But that's a question I think might be kind of fun to throw at them. You know, it wasn't that many years ago, you were just you know, armed to the teeth against the Soviet Union because of all their tyrannical practices. But now, when Ed Snowden wants to escape yeah, your death a, threats, a funny he has thing. to go to Russia to you do have so. A great quality. What happened? Can you explain while, that? While you Dick are Cheney or any of these other people? No. Of something wonderful, the they can't. descent into uh, madness or what you call an overly structured way of living, you yet maintain that sense of having fun, of playing with it, of playing with the ideas. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I always thought it would be a, a fun play to write. And I, I even had a title for it. It was the, the Masters of Creation, I think, was there something along those lines. When Henry Ford and uh, <laughs> Thomas Edison and Burroughs, and there was a fourth person, used to take these trips out of the country, just trips, just for the fun of it, just little vacations, just to chit chat with one another. Can you imagine that kind of a relationship? I was back in <clears throat> Concord, Massachusetts one time a number of years ago <clears throat> and visited Ralph Waldo Emerson's home and realized that right, right down the street, not very far, was the home of the Alcotts. Oh, uh, and of course, who who lived in Emerson's house? Henry David Thoreau. And uh, oh, the novelist wrote House of Seven Gables. All it's slipping my mind right now. They all lived within walking distance of one another. Wouldn't it just the the power of place of something like that? Where the Alcotts and Thoreau and Emerson are all just sitting around on the front porch one evening, chit-chatting. Yeah. Might that have been interesting? <laughs> Wouldn't have been nice to have had a, a recording of that, or of Edison and Ford and so forth with their conversation. But they were doing it just for fun. Part, part of the creative process requires you just to step back and say, I'm just... I'm going to have a vacation. What does vacation mean? It means to vacate, to vacate your mind. Get away from your nose to the grindstone thing and just go out and do this other stuff. Why? Because it generates more creativity. It really does. People don't see it. No, no, no. I just got to gotta stay, stay on touch here. I have to stay right. My nose to the grindstone here. Can't get away from that. No, can't get away from that. You got to... Deadline to meet. Well, da, 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 da. well been, maybe at some uh, point pleasure, you need like, to just... talk about having fun. Talk about okay. play. Enough. Um, just been a pleasure to talk with you this evening. <laughs> I want to redesign how I'm living. Uh... Well, it should be. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been fun too, for me. But it, it's. It's what we need to do. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is what 
life is about there's a spontaneity to life that we've given up on you know we, we got this as kids in school didn't we you know if you're too spontaneous in school oh you suffer from attention deficit disorder which means yeah which means you're not on the same you don't have the same agenda as the teacher so we're going to drug you kid uh we're going to control you pressure you and in some way so that you'll want to do what we want you to do. And the healthy kids, I remember when Steve Jobs made the statement, it was published shortly after his death, about how the school system nearly got to him. So they subjected me to a kind of discipline I was not familiar with and I didn't like it. And I got out of there just in time. If I hadn't, they would have crushed all of my sense of curiosity. Yeah. That ought to be that yeah. sign ought to how be many, put how up. How many more Steve uh, Jobs are there? Every government school, maybe, maybe every lot of private place. school, every school in the country, as a warning. Warning: This place may be dangerous to your sense of being. <laughs> Well, Eric Hoffer was one of my favorites. Eric Hoffer was a man who uh, lost, he, he'd gone to school till about the age of eight or nine, something like that, then suddenly lost his eyesight for some inexplicable reason. And the school didn't have any way of dealing with a blind kid, so he was just basically kept at home. When he turned about 15 or 16, his eyesight suddenly returned, but he was too old now to go back to you know, earlier grades. So he went out and worked. It's very menial work. He worked as a lettuce picker. He worked as a longshoreman in San Francisco. A lot of work like this. But he spent all of his spare time in libraries or used bookstores. And he wrote some of the most prolific, most creative stuff I've ever seen from any American writer. Uh, the, his best known work is The True Believer. And the socialists tried to get a hold of him and say, aha, here's our man. Here's the, the, the Renaissance man, the man who kind of like, oh. you know, the lowly serf who rises up to greatness and so forth. Right. And right. Hoffer would have nothing okay. to do with it. He said, uh, you, guys, so, uh, you guys are just a bunch of people who want to control other people. what I want to do uh, to wrap up just before uh, we no go is I like to take a few minutes to talk about a few again, new Libby.me things that are coming up and let people know about that away from the and uh, give people a couple of links where they can find uh, this book and other Butler anyway. and Schaefer, uh, stuff. So first I'll talk about the Libby.me things, promote some of that, then I'll promote some Butler Shaper stuff, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Butler, to, to give it some final words. Uh, so, yeah, uh, well, not the final word, but like a... <laughs> Final. Yeah, the fi that's good. You can ask the final question. <laughs> yeah. You've been saving it, right? You wrote it down. <laughs> the final word? <laughs> so uh, tomorrow night, I'm back on uh, Jerry, the final the question. Same time, so that's 9 Eastern. The ultimate, uh, I'm on with the uh, Steve Patterson question, and Mark. Sam Patterson, the Bitcoin <laughs> brothers. And I have Woo! just put the link in the chat there. And these are... Uh, oh. I kind of. It took me a bit to realize that Steve Sat Patterson, uh, who has written the book "What's the Big Deal About Bitcoin," and Sam Patterson, who wrote the Liberty.me Guide Up and Running with Bitcoin, were related to each other. It was only when I started talking to them face to face that I thought, "Hey, you you guys look a lot alike." <laughs> and uh, so I figured out that they're brothers, and so we're getting them on together tomorrow night. And I don't understand Bitcoin. I do not own any Bitcoin. Uh, they're going to give me my first piece of Bitcoin tomorrow night, and then I'm going to mm. buy something with it. I don't know what. Uh, so we're, we're going to, speaking of playing around with things, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Ask them about, uh, I was noticing in the college football bowl games, 
most of them, so, not say most of them, so many of them are just military stuff. We're going to have the military bowl, we're going to have the uh, drop a bomb on could. somebody bowl, uh, whatever and it was. Then, um, but there was one bowl. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking with them. I'm one bowl called the Bitcoin bowl. The question from I Butler thought, Shaver well, night to the next. Maybe, then I'll get them maybe to pose a question that we can ask of Jeffrey Tucker, whom we uh, have on Sunday night I'll give you something to talk uh, at about 8 p.m. Eastern. And we're talking, uh, speaking of money, what has government done to our money, the famous Murray Rothbard book. So uh, Jeffrey's going to be covering that. Here's the link. You can go sign up for that one. And I also want to mention something else by Jeffrey Tucker here. Let me show it to you on the Kindle. And, uh, there we go. I just want to show you. This is, can you guys see that? There, that the cover of uh, Jeffrey's newest book, Bit by Bit, which we just released uh, less, than a, less than three weeks ago. And it's free to all Liberty.me members. So if you're watching this, you can go and get it right now and enjoy it. Here's the link. This is, I mean, a lot of the same thing, themes that Butler's been talking about this evening. Uh, decentralization, secession, uh, and the Bitcoin stuff too, of course, kind of post-government uh, money. Now, a lot of the same themes um, with a real kind of future orientation, orientation on the entrepreneurship and technology that's uh, changing our world right now. So I encourage you guys to check that one out too. And uh, now I want to tell you guys about just two things, two great resources for Butler Shaper stuff. Here is the link where you can go and get uh, the book we've been talking about this evening, or the book that kind of sp sparked our conversation anyway this evening, which is The Wizards of Ozzy and I want to show you guys uh, that one on my uh, side too. There's The Wizards of Ozzy and You can see there's the, there's the statue, the Ozzy and <laughs> And uh, I think Grant thinks it looks like a... Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's who it is. This is actually a statue from 3,000 years from now, because 1,000 years from now, people are going to make a statue of Butler Schaefer, and they call these Butler Schaefer institutions. It looks just like him, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's ironic. It like me, too. For you. What is um, it? So that's uh, Wizards of Ozzy <laughs> and Dias, and I put the link in, you can go get it. And also, I want you guys to see Butler's blog within Liberty.me, so... <laughs> yeah, behold the works of Butler Schaefer in despair. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> the, uh, if you want to catch up on new Butler Schaefer articles, those are appearing in that, yeah. that blog site all the time, butlershaefer.liberty.me. Okay, that's all the stuff uh, I've got to do my advertising for. Uh, you go ahead, Butler. Okay. Yeah, of course. <laughs> And, and I, wow. And, and I'm, I'm also I'm it. also on LouRockwell.com, so number of different places there. And I'm working on three more books. So one of these days I'll get around to those. One I think I'll have finished in about two weeks. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think Mises is going to publish this. I've had some conversations with him about it. The title of it is going to be, Please Don't well, Feed you... the Cannibals. Oh, uh, that's all for me. This is where you pose the ultimate question, Butler. Anyhow. <laughs> Anything else? Hmm? The ultimate question, yeah. The ultimate question is, what is the ultimate question? <laughs> as, I, as I tell my students, don't, don't spend so much of your time looking for answers. Try to improve your questions. I, that's not, I, I'm not just playing games with you when I say that. That's really, that's really where understanding arises, is from improving your questions. There's a ton of people out there who, who are willing to give you answers. But as Milton Mayer said, as I the quoted him before, the questions that can be answered aren't worth asking. Thomas Pynchon has a related quote, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about answers. So, you know, it's, there's a, there's a tendency I think we all have to, somebody asks us a question, we want to come up with, an answer when we what we should be doing is maybe going back and challenging the question. Maybe the question isn't posed right. You know, what country should the U.S. have have been bombing? 
Well, maybe that's not the right question. Maybe there's another question that we should be asking ourselves. But it's fun. Above all, have intelligent, thoughtful, creative, questioning, fun in all of this. And that's the way life Life is just more interesting when it's done with fun and spontaneity and and so forth. When you get stuck on the need for certainty, uh, you start getting miserable. It's kind of like my ongoing quarrel with a number of people who think there's such a thing as ob objective truths, objective moral values, and so forth. I've always taken the position, oh, this is all subjective. It may be, what I'm saying may be valid, may be true. It, it's my subjective opinion that certain things happen. Um, and they can be tested and the results can be viewed and so forth. So the conclusion I reach may be, may, be, may in fact be quite correct, but it's still coming from my opinion as to, my subjective opinion as to what the answer is. Something we started off with earlier. Does the sun go around the earth or does the earth go around the sun? How would we find out? How would we find out? Which is really the, the answer to an awful lot of the questions that we deal with in life. Like a question, well, in a completely free society, how would highways be built? How would hospitals be built and all this sort of stuff? My answer has always been the same. I have no idea. I am not the answer man. I am not Plato's philosopher king. There are umpty 7,000 people out there who are going to be playing around with some of these ideas that I would never have thought about. They might not be, quote, libertarian in any kind of disposition, but though they come up with something, somebody else will come up with another way of doing it. The third guy will come up with it, yeah, the other third way. And we, we just keep playing this stuff around. But the idea that there's a correct way and that we can figure out in advance of our experiences. Do you think that the government officials who created the internet anticipated what they got? That's the that's the fun part of all this. The unpredictable nature of chaotic systems, complex systems. It gives you great hope. You're, you, you guys are all living at great times. You really are. The short term, it's going to continue to be ugly. But I suspect that most people watching this will be living fundamentally different and improved lives than they're living right now. It's just the optimism that comes from respecting life. I think at some point we have this this, this life life force, for <laughs> lack one, of a better just word. One thought from Butler Saver. It's that. energized within us all. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I could be doing that. <laughs> oh, well, wonderful. So Thank anyway, you so much, uh, Butler Schaefer, for joining us. Thank that's you, my everybody. For the I'll night. see you again tomorrow night on Liberty.me Live. Well, it's been well, wonderful yeah. again. Bye, everybody. Have a great night. Well, that that Thank would you. be it. So. Thank, thank, you for, uh, thank you for having me. Adios. How did you know it was over? Because I heard you yakking. Hmm? I heard you yakking. You what? I heard you say. Oh. Okay.